You're listening to the Dibbly Dobbly Podcast. Remember to like, share, comment, subscribe, and click the bell to make sure you get the latest episodes of the podcast. Be sure to like and share our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter and on Instagram. Hi, I'm John Alden, the CEO of Cricket Espana, the Chief Executive Officer, and welcome to the Dibbly Dobbly Podcast. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Dibbly Dobbly podcast. And on the podcast, we have started a new series on the podcast, looking at associate nations within cricket and how they are developing the game in their country. Many of us cricket fans know so much about the established cricketing countries and not enough on the associate nations who play cricket. So it would be nice to learn more about those associate countries and via the podcast, people can learn more as well. For today's Associate Cricket Series episode, we are discussing all things Spain cricket. And joining me to discuss and talk all things Spain cricket is the CEO of Cricket Spain, John Howden. John, welcome. Good afternoon, Jake. It's great to have you here, John. Thank you so much. And um, thank you for, for coming on to talk about all things cricket in Spain, because uh, many people would think cricket in Spain? No, it doesn't really work, doesn't it? Uh, it's more football, it's more soccer, or some people like to call it. Um, but it couldn't be further from the truth. And cricket does have a place in the sporting landscape in in um, in Spain. So it would be good to get your insights on the good work that the organization is doing, Cricket Spain, and and how you're promoting and growing the sport in, in the country. And it would be good to, you know, learn a bit more as well about yourself and your role as CEO and and just, you know, what cricket is is doing in Spain to make a difference. And then that's what cricket does. It makes a difference to people's lives and has a positive impact. So it'd be good to hear all those things as we chat, John. But before we do that, John, as I do with all my guests that I've interviewed on the podcast, I like to take them back to when they first got into cricket. And it's been very fascinating listening to people's memories on how they started to get into cricket. So John, let's go back to the very beginning. I know that's a long time ago, growing up. Uh, <laughs> What were you? What were your earliest memories of watching, playing, and even going to the cricket? And who were some of your cricketing idols that you looked up to growing up? Yeah. One of my earliest memories of uh, cricket was I actually went to a cricket match while I was at school. Uh, it was Yorkshire v Somerset, Abbeydale Park in Sheffield, um, and Viv Richards and Joel Garner were two of the Somerset players that were playing. It was actually a school day. I'd, I'd done quite well in my exams, so I asked my mom if I could go, and she said, yes, no problem. So off I skipped to the game, their scoring, and then when I got back from the game that evening, I had a look on the back page of the local newspaper, and there I was, smack bang in a photograph, uh, in, a, in a photo that said, a sunny Sheffield crowd admiring the cricket in Sheffield. Um, when I went to school the next day, all along the school notice boards, there was a, my picture everywhere, you know, what my friends had put up on the school notice board. Uh, so I had to go and see the headmaster and explain why I'd not been in school that day. Uh, so that's probably one of my earliest memories of cricket, uh, that I, 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 I happened to go to a game when I was, should have been in school and got reprimanded for it. Uh, <laughs> My actual school teacher, my PE teacher in, um, in my school was Ari Cartwright, who actually played for Derbyshire. Uh, and so he was a big influence on, on me being involved in cricket and enjoying cricket. I remember one game that we had uh, against a rival school. We bowled them out for 44, and then we were 44 for four. And we was all out for 44 as well. So we lost six wickets for no runs. And I was one of those six wickets out second ball being stumped after being psyched out by the wicketkeeper after the first ball. So uh, that didn't go down very well with him, you know, after that. Uh, and then I was also, another big memory is when I was at Trent Bridge, being from Yorkshire, Jeff Boycott was, was a favourite of mine. Uh, and I was at Trent Bridge the day that he ran out, Derek Randall. So that was uh, quite an historic day to be involved with cricket, even if it was just watching the game. So they're my three main big histories of, of um, cricket, um, my, main, my main remembrances when I was a youngster. Definitely. Um, and they stick in your mind for a very long time. And it's good to 
think back to those good old, good old days of watching the game and uh, and that's why you're still in love with the game today obviously from an administration uh, administration point of view I should say with cricket Spain and your job there as CEO yeah. um you're, you're cricketing idols who did you really look up to the most growing up you know I really like Chris old uh, who was an all-rounder he was a right hand bowler and a left hand batter and the very first game that I saw, I think it was my very first game, were, was uh, Yorkshire v Worcestershire in 1974 in Uddersfield. Um, you know, and Uddersfield's not been used as a ground for Yorkshire for quite a while. And he scored like 70, 74, something like that. And he took a couple of wickets. And the fact I'd seen him live, um, kind of thought yes this is a good player and so after that I kind of followed his career uh, and I think he ended up in Devon working in a supermarket after his uh, after he'd finished his Yorkshire and England career so he was one of my big players not not that well known you know but he did play for England but just the fact that the very first game I went to he was probably the player of the match and it kind of stuck with me and I followed his career as a result of that. Definitely. Um, how would you describe yourself as a as a player? Were you a, a batter, or bowler, or rounder, or keeper, a bit of both? Or very average is what I describe myself as a player. Uh, probably my best asset uh, was my fielding. You know? Yeah, and I got tagged the nickname of John T with my last game. <laughs> so uh, batting, uh, I would be. Number 11, you know. Uh, and even though I was at number 11, I was usually not a red inker, you know. I was usually the one that got out. Uh, yeah. And my bowling was just dibbly doblies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. The, the name of the podcast, dibbly doblies. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Dibbly doblies. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Well, yeah, I can join the club as well, John. Adding a number 11 is not a good place. Uh, yeah. You've got to come in when you're nine down and team's in trouble and then you're often the last wicket to fall anyway. So, indeed, indeed. Yeah, yeah. It's not a good feeling. But, oh, well, that's a part of the game, isn't it? Having yeah. fun and enjoying it. And, yeah. It's uh, a camaraderie yeah. more than anything. You know? Yes. Yeah. Yes, exactly right. Yeah. Build friendships and memories for life, um, which is fantastic. Um, so it was good to hear about your introduction into the game, John, and your journey and how it all started. And everyone's different their introduction to cricket so it's nice to hear that uh from you your your story and how you got into this game and f fell in love with this game ever since and doing some good things with cricket spain as we'll talk to you about in this uh, episode as we progress further so it was good to to hear about your cricketing journey so thank you for that john for, for sharing that You're with welcome. us You're welcome. um i thought to start this interview john on on cricket spain um let's talk about the history of cricket in Spain because you can learn a lot about cricket from its history and the history of cricket in Spain is quite interesting. Uh, so, so John, give us a brief overview on, on the history of cricket in Spain, how it became really known in Spain and how it really all started. So if you can share that with us. Sure, I'll try. Uh, going back quite a while, I mean, the first recorded history of cricket in Spain is 1809 and that's when the Duke of Wellington and his troops uh, were around the Iberian pen Peninsula and they started playing on the pier or against expats in certain regions. Um, and that's the first recorded documentation way back then. Fast forward into um, 1975, we had a Madrid cricket club started, uh, started and they used to play matches against the English Embassy, uh, the British Embassy of Madrid. One of their players uh, left to go to Barcelona and he organised a club in Barcelona. So then we started getting our first cricket, El Clasicos. So the first two cl clubs were, were um, Madrid and Barcelona. Yeah. Fast forward in a, a little bit after that, we had our first uh, executive meeting in 1989 uh, in Madrid, uh, the director, and then in 1992, we joined, which is now the ICC, 
we became a, an affiliate member. Uh, we was um, proposed by Denmark and seconded by Argentina, or the other way around, uh, and we got accepted into the ICC. Uh, in 2000, we had our very first ICC tournament. We, we hosted an indoor tournament in Avia, uh, and there was 10 countries, and we came six in the competition, and all the players were born in Spain. So it was, a, you know, it was an exclusive Spanish side. A lot of them had only just been playing cricket for a few years, uh, and they came to sixth in the competition, which we feel was quite a credible achievement. Yeah. And then um, since then, we've had a cluster, uh, we've hosted a cluster of ICC tournaments. We've, um, we've hosted um, uh, European Championships level twos. And then we've actually hosted tournaments ourselves that um, we've not been part of. We're, we're fortunate to have quite a few um, grounds that have got glass, wick, glass wickets um, and uh, are good stadiums, good good uh, venues. And last last year we hosted the uh, women's European uh, well European no women's world qualifiers, which was um, Scotland, Ireland, Netherlands, and France. Scotland. Netherlands, Italy, and France. That's right. And that was played at Desert Springs, uh, which has also received one day international accredited status from the ICC. Uh, our last tournament there was uh, uh, a one day international T20I event between Scotland and Ireland. So they've actually had a one day international accredited series at Desert Springs now. We're hoping to have, have more. Uh, at, the, at the current time, uh, we're, we're heavily involved with the European Cricket Network. Uh, and currently, the European Champions League, the European Cricket League, which is the equivalent of the Champions League of Europe for football, is being played at the Cartama Oval, which is near Malaga. Uh, there's 33 countries. Uh, no, 32 countries, but 33 teams involved in the event, uh, which is done in group stages. The, there's seven or eight groups, um, and then the winners of each group come back for finals week. It's uh, been live streamed, uh, loads of exposure for, for Spanish cricket. Um, uh, and we've been doing this. We had our first event in 2019 with the ECC uh, at the Manga. And we've also, we were the initial country to have the first European Cricket Series and the European Cricket Championships for women as well. So we, we have a really good relationship with the European Cricket Network. Um, and, you know, they're, they're, they're an integral part of Spanish cricket at this moment in time. Yeah. It was oh, and it's Daniel's birthday today. He was the founder of the ECC. So happy yeah. birthday, Daniel. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was good to good to hear about the the history of cricket in Spain, John. And what I've noticed is that um, you always have that connection with England in some way, because obviously England ruled half the world for mm. many years and brought cricket to many of these associate countries. So it's very similar in how all the um, mm. countries became accustomed to cricket, and no different with Spain, as yeah. you mentioned. Um, so it was it was good to to hear that. Uh, long history of how the game got established and started in Spain um, and it continues to progress for, for the years uh, to come and um, growing stronger and stronger every year. So uh, thank you for that, John. Thank you uh, for that brief history lesson you gave us on the history of cricket in Spain. I think a lot of people would have learned a lot of, a lot about how it all started and, and that's the main thing. So, so thank you for, for sharing that with us, John. Uh, much appreciated. Um, and, and I'm sure everyone listening would have learned a lot more about the history of, of cricket in Spain as well. Um, I thought we now talk about uh, the Spain national cricket teams, John, the, the women's and the men's teams. Uh, 
be good to gain your insights on the two teams and learn more about their achievements, the players' stories, because many of the players come from diverse backgrounds mm -hmm. uh, to get where they are playing for the national sides. Um, so, John, for those who may not know a lot about the, the Spain women's and men's teams, can you tell us more about them, some of the players and their, and their stories? Absolutely. Um, currently, uh, the men are ranked 34th in the world on the T20I rankings, and the women are ranked 35th in, in the world. So they're, they're pretty much on parity with each other. We just missed out by one place on, on the, the World Challenge League. Uh, Saudi Arabia got the last, uh, last position, um, and it went down to the last match. They had to beat Qatar in the last match, um, you know, for the, to qualify for the event. Uh, and they, they did. If they'd have lost that match, then we would have been in the, the, the Challenge League that's just finished at uh, the Titoli, Tanzania, uh, and two other countries um, qualified for. Um, the, the recent matches that we've had, the most recent series was um, a T10 competition in Barcelona, which uh, happened in January, uh, our first international event of the year. And both the men and women played simultaneously against the Czech Republic. Uh, and both teams won every game that was played in, in that uh, event up in the Montjuic Stadium. Uh, it was a five match series for each of the, the men and women and they both won the, the series uh, quite comfortably. So that was a good start to the year. The men uh, are embarking on a, a, a bilateral series with Jersey in April in the Mango, which will be a very stern test because Jersey are a very, very good side. They're a quality side. Um, Asa Tribe is at Glamorgan at the moment. And then John C. Jen is just coming off the back of um, two impressive innings in the EC, ECL competition for his club uh, only last week. He, he got 100, 97 and 100, I think, something like that. So he's certainly one that uh, we are uh, we are very well aware of and there isn't a weakness in their side. So uh, it should be an enthralling series um, and it's going to be a big challenge for us because there are quite a few places ahead of us in the T20 rankings. Um, and then after, after that, we have uh, a T10 international in Brescia against uh, Italy, and that's in May, and that will be a good warm-up for our uh, um, qualification uh, qualifiers, ICC Europe qualifiers, where we are heading to Guernsey, uh, and Guernsey and Denmark on paper look to the big, be the biggest threats to us uh, for further progression in, in, the, in that ICC event. The women, as I said, the women also uh, played in, in Barcelona and had uh, excellent results. It was a little bit closer than the men, uh, and one of the games actually went down to the golden ball, which is one of the things that uh, um, the ECN do to uh, prevent a tie. Uh, and we were fortunate, fortunate enough to come on the, the right side of the golden ball. The, the women will be also heading to um, Italy at the same time as the men to play against the women's team. Uh, again, that's going to be a big challenge. We've played our friends in Italy numerous times and uh, we've yet to beat them. So, uh, um, you know, it's a step up for us. Um, and, and, and we feel that we're progressing nicely. Every game we play, we feel we're getting a little bit better. So... Uh, we're hoping to run them really close uh, in this event. Uh, we are working on some T20i ranking matches against uh, two differing oppositions, but that's not been confirmed yet. So uh, we are hoping that it will be confirmed in the next uh, few weeks. And then finally on the calendar at the moment, we've got uh, a series against Austria in Vienna uh in september that is another t10i um t10 international and again we've played austria numerous times uh our girls really like their girls there's a good camaraderie between 
both sets of uh, players. Um, and the last series that we played against them, we split the series 1-1. One, one. So there's, you know, it should be a competitive affair. And then finally, there's the European Championship uh, in Cartima, which was brought in by the ECN last year. And there was five teams last year. And the competition was very stiff last year. It was uh, England, Netherlands, Italy, Austria, and ourselves. Um, this year, the increasing it to 10 teams and Spain will be in uh, in the second division where they'll be playing the likes of Jersey, Austria uh, and a couple of other teams as well. Um, so <laughs> it will be another interesting tournament for the girls to be involved with. In terms of players, uh, in our men's team, uh, we've got a, an Australian called Josh Tremberth, who actually plays in Victoria in the same in the in, in the same side as Peter Hanscom. Uh, and he tends to come over for because of the logistics, he tends to come over for the for the ICC events. And we're he, he played in the Belgium tournament last time and we're open to have him uh, come across when we go to Guernsey. Again, he has a Spanish mother, so he's, he's Spanish passport older. Uh, uh, and yeah, he, he could be a match winner for us, you know. Uh, another very talented player is Daniel Doyle Kelly. He's a South African player who actually played his cricket last year in, uh, in Holland with Hermes Cricket Club. And they got promotion to the Heer division um, in both the 50 over and T20 format. So he'll be playing in the first division grade cricket in Holland next year because they've requested, they've, they've asked him to come back, you know, because he, he had a very success, successful season there. Um, he's also going to the Western Cup in Portugal, which is an event that's been created by the ECN. And in effect, it's, 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 it's like a Ryder Cup. It's mainline Europe against England, Scotland, Ireland, Guernsey and Jersey. Uh, and that takes place uh, next month. And he's one of three, three players from Spain that's been invited to go to that tournament, uh, along with the coach, our coach, Corey Rutgers, who is coaching the, uh, the European side. The other two players that are heading there are Mohamed Ishan and Amza Dar. They they both um, explosive batsmen. Uh, Amster also bows a little bit, and uh, Ishan is is a is a wicketkeeper. Yeah, so that's kind of some of the key players in in the men's team. In the women's team, uh, we've got um, three or four English-based players uh, that uh, you know a very good standard. We've got Naomi Ilman Barreo, uh, who plays in Hampshire, and um, she um, she has a Spanish mother, and she scored 99 in a recent T10 against Malta, um, and she's one to look out for. And the two golden balls that we've had in the ECN competition, she's been the bowler, and we've emerged victorious on both sides. Um, we also have um, Amy Carrera Brown. Amy Brown Carrera, uh, who uh, plays her cricket in Yorkshire. She's a very good netball and hockey player as well. So we're, we're, we're trying hard to make sure she continues to focus on cricket. Um, uh, and, and she's a, our opening bowler, our, our main line spirit, spirit bowler. Um, a new recruit is Andrea Soler, uh, Andrea Davidson Soler. Um, and her brother also plays for the national team. So uh, it's the first time ever that we've had a brother and sister playing uh, in the Spanish squads simultaneously. And there's a, a third sibling who's a younger brother, and uh, we've heard good things about, about him from the parents too. So we're hoping that he will play, he will play for Spain in, in the future as well. Um, probably the, the final one to mention today is Uzwa Sahid. A leg spinner, uh, incredibly passionate about the game. She'll get up before breakfast to have a net. 
Her brother has played in the Kashmir Premier League, uh, went to Scotland and Ireland at the One Day Internationals in Desert Springs. Herself and Payel uh, Chilonga, two of our national team players, were invited to come down and have a net with, uh, with Scotland and, and Ireland. So they got to bowl at uh, uh, the Bryce sisters and, and a, a few of the key players. So that's kind of um, a, so a synopsis of um, some of the players in the in the in the two national teams. By no by no means uh, uh, all of them, and I apologise to some of the players if I've not mentioned them. Yeah, uh, uh, thank you for that, John. It was very good of you to uh, share that about the the two teams and what they're doing and their achievements, the player stories, um, and and what they've done, um, and playing in global tournaments, as you mentioned, ICC events, T20 World Cup qualifiers and that. Uh, from your point of view as a, as a CEO and as a cricket board, uh, are you really optimistic and hopeful that one day, you know, either the women's or men's team can perform really well and, and hopefully make a global ICC event in, in the years to come? Um, absolutely. I mean, um, we're definitely going in an upward curve uh, because on the scorecard rankings this last time, we've gone up seven places, which was the most of any European country. Um, our funding's increased um, drastically as a result of that. Uh, and so we're, we're looking to put that in both grassroots and the high performance uh, uh, areas. Uh, we have a strategic plan that runs from 2023 until 2027. Uh, and the, two of the goals that we had was for the men's team to reach the top 30, uh, which, you know, by the next cycle would then give them the opportunity of global, uh, uh, playing global cricket. And for the women's team to reach the top 50 now the 35th in the world at the moment so we probably under underestimated uh, that and we probably need to reevaluate it and look to get them in the top 30 as well um so yes we we, we would definitely jump at the chance uh, at uh, at playing uh, 50 over cricket and global cricket we have had some some uh, interest from uh, uh teams outside Europe to come and play us. Uh, uh, and it's something, you know, we, we may look at and invest in, in, in the future. Definitely. Definitely. Um, and um, from what you, you've said, it's, it's all positive and it's in an upward projection and mm. uh, you're pretty optimistic about uh, the future, which is fantastic. Yeah. Um, on both teams um, in terms of bilateral series, playing more with countries, would you like to see, you know, both the women's and men's team play more against other countries to build up that experience? Because at the moment, the men's team are uh, looking at the stats have played 33 T20 nationals since they got status in 2019. Mm. And the women uh, obviously debuted in women's T20 internationals in 2022 and have only played eight games. Yeah. yeah. Um, would you like to see those numbers increase more as the years and uh, the calendars get released mm. into the future? Hundred percent, and um, um, the the way I don't know if you know, but the way the um, the rankings work on May the first, the three years prior matches go off. So we we definitely need to get. We'd love to have parity for the girls and boys, you know, for the men and women, and get them close or on equal numbers of 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 games played. Um, our, our, our women's team kind of only materialized uh, in 2021 2022 and the very first tournament that they played was at desert springs where we had five countries including spain play um and that got us the ranking because we played six six matches there and we'd also played against france previously as well but some of them will go off so we need to get some more matches for the ladies to keep 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 the ranking intact in terms with the men, yeah, we, we we study the scorecard and we we look to play um, countries um, that you know we feel will help the, the scorecard ranking. You know that 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 is uh, one of our objectives. You know, it's not that we won't won't play teams that 
don't impact the score, scorecard very much, but you know, with a limited amount of funding, we have priorities against the teams that we would like to play. And we're developing that strategy with the women as well. Yeah, so uh, as I said, we're, we're, in the for, we're, in, uh, we're in the progress of uh, dotting, the T's, uh, dotting the I's and crossing the T's with, with two countries to come to Barcelona in June. And hopefully that, that uh, information will be made public soon. Uh, bilateral series with Germany, uh, Jersey is, you know, is a big coup for us because they're, they're ranked um, 24th, 25th in the world, something like that at the moment. So yeah, they're, they're, a, they're a great challenge for us and, and we want to push our players to be playing against the best teams in the world. Yeah. Um, a, a question that I had for you, John, is the, the environment and the culture within the two right. teams. Uh, so what culture and what um okay. philosophy you're trying to instill on the teams in terms of how they go about their cricket and um all that stuff so just tell us about the environment the culture that you're trying yeah. to create okay to try and make these two teams successful as, as mm. they can yeah the the makeup of the team we'll go with the men's first the makeup of the team is they they all speak spanish on the field yeah, yeah. That, that is that is uh, uh what we've uh morphed into basically maybe three four years ago it was a mixture of asian punjabi uh english spanish on the field but now it's pretty much collectively um all spanish on the field uh, in the last few years we've added a strength and conditioning coach to the men's as well which seems to be paying off uh and we had a changing coach uh, a few years ago uh and the new coach is is um is is Corey Rutgers, who's actually also coached in a franchise with Dean Jones in Pakistan. So he, you know, he's got a good pedigree, uh, and uh, he's is is demanding uh, in in a positive way. You know, uh, is 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 always looking uh, to move us forward, uh, which makes my job challenging at a time. But uh, it's the kind of challenges that. That we want to we want to uh, have put against us to make the the side better. In yeah. terms of the women, uh, again, pretty much speak Spanish. It, the makeup is the, a lot of the girls are, are, are Spanish passport holders. You know, there's an handful that meet it through the ICC criteria of being living in the country for three years, have residencia, and a few other add-ons. But the majority uh, of the the girls are Spanish. A few months ago, uh, we uh, paid a company to do a uh, do an assessment uh, on the computers of any players that are playing cricket that were born in Spain, uh, and that yielded uh, Alex and Andrea Soler Davison because they were on the uh, on, on on the list. Uh, and there was um, a few of the players, Danny Rodriguez, uh, Martinez, he was on that list as well. So we, we got a few players as a result of this. And um, as a result of a few players from England playing in the Spanish national teams, more people have made inquiries. And one of the girls that is going to Italy will be making a debut. And she heard about uh, Spanish cricket through... Uh, through seeing that there was other English players with Spanish based uh, Spanish parents and Spanish passports playing in the Spanish national side. So we've had a lot of inquiries uh, about the possibility of playing for Spain and quite a few people um, we've been made aware of that are definitely, um, you know, uh, have the potential to play for Spain in the future. Yeah, yeah that's good to hear. That's, that's really encouraging to, to mm. hear that. Um, and how the culture and the environment is working together in harmony to create a competitive cricket team for the for the women's and the men's, which is fantastic. Mm. Um, professionalism, in terms of becoming professional contracts yeah. or all yeah. that stuff, which yeah. uh, I spoke to Matt Featherston from Cricket Brazil. Yeah, yeah, I was just, yeah. Great guy, Matt. Um, yeah, yeah. I was just going to suggest we would love to be at the same position yeah. uh with with what brazil did with with their women and, and contracts yeah and i actually spoke to him 
at the conference in in Durban in South Africa about yeah. how that came about, and it gave me some very good. It gave some good ideas of how to go about that. And I asked him about, you know, how did the men feel about the fact that the women had got um, central contracts and and the men are not and stuff. So it's something that's it's it's hovering around. It's it's brewing, and we'd love to get to that stage. We don't feel we're at that stage yet. Um, uh, quite a few of our individual players, especially the men, you know, could be on the cusp of uh, you know professional cricket, and and one or two of them are. Uh, are making a mm, making a wage out of it and being self sufficient through just cricket at the moment. Uh, it's it's definitely a conversation on the table, but we've not got to the point yet where we're having central contracts. Um, but in terms of professional professionalism, employing a strength on good conditioning coach and um, and you know that takes care of the dietary needs and uh, and as them on uh, training programs and stuff. That that was the last step we took towards making us towards professionalism and uh, and Corey and Neil Corey of the men's side and Neil Brook of the women's side kind of you know, imprint a professionalism with their approach to cricket anyway. Yeah, well that's that's good to hear. Obviously, um, that you're working towards that down the track, uh, probably in the near uh, mid you know long term, I should say. Um, trying to work towards that and trying to make it mm. um, viable for people to stay and play cricket in Spain. Uh, do you have many players that play for the national teams, both women's and men's, and then they decide to leave afterwards? That's been a common theme with associate countries around the world. Mm. Um, due to economic, economics and, and work and availability, uh, not so much leave, I don't think, more availability. As the cricket becomes more and more, it, they have to offset it against their holidays. Uh, and quite often, you know, a lot of the players that play for the national team, all their holidays are taken up with cricket, you know. Yeah. Um, so it means no holidays with family and stuff like that. So you, you do need a lot of commitment at this level to be playing national cricket and although we try and make it that they're not out of pocket you know in terms of giving them the kind of expenses that we can afford um invariably you know that unless if they've not got a good employer it could mean that they're losing wages um we've even had one person who lost their, their job because he decided he wanted to play for spain rather than um not be available for the the tournament that we wanted him to play in. So, you know, that's the kind of commitment that these guys are giving to their country. Um, it's not it's not all a bed of roses. Um, a lot of the time, they're having to dip into their own pocket uh, to make sure that they can play in the yeah. events. Yeah, you, you hear that a lot with many associate players doing that. Um, mm because it, it is a sacrifice, but it's also playing for your country in any sport, and that's a great honour in itself. Mm -hmm. um, so you have some difficulties and challenges there and uh, working yeah. towards dealing with that in a better way than it is at the moment. So that's promising. Um, in terms of the support, do the Spanish people get behind the, the teams? Do, do they uh, rally around the teams and, mm -hmm. and support them like they do in other Sports like football, for example, um, the, getting more and more so. Uh, uh, you, when, when you first speak to a Spaniard, invariably they say, "Is cricket croquet, or <laughs> it's a game for five days that ends in a draw?" That's yeah. that tends to be the initial response for anyone who's Spanish who doesn't know cricket. But when we have time to say to them, "Well," No, that, that's not the case. Um, we've actually got a format which is popular in Spain, uh, which is as, as only as long as a football match, and it's always got a result, you know. So why not give that a go, see what you think, and then we can gradually introduce them to the more traditional side of cricket. But to get that first step, to just put a bat and ball in front of them 
and get them playing in a competitive arena, we found that uh, a shorter format of the game, uh, we're less time away from family and just introducing them to the enjoyment and love of the, the sport is the best way to go forward. Definitely, definitely. Um, just finding ways and strategies of how to, uh, you know, try and get incorporate cricket into yeah. people's lives in Spain yeah. and how to get accustomed to the game, yeah. um, which which you need to try and work through um, those uh, areas and challenges. Um, in terms of the team going going forward, um, what are you, what are you hopeful for for the for the teams going into the future, John? What are your predictions for the teams going uh, into the future? Would, um, what are you looking forward to the most? Um, and do you think the teams will achieve great things going in going into the future? Okay. Well, just backing up a little bit on the on the challenges side of things. One of the big challenges we have is the logistics of the country. You know, especially with the the women's game, uh, where we might might have three or four players playing in Seville, uh, but no no team, and then four or five players playing in Murcia, but no team. Uh, um, and so we've got to find a way of bringing them, give, getting them cricket, you know, because what they want, they just don't want to be doing nets every every weekend. They want some form of competitive cricket. Um, and although some of them play in the men's team, they would love to have their own women's team. So what we've done and what we've launched this season is uh, a national women's league. Well, it's got six teams in. Uh, um, the Madrid Royals, the um, Barcelona Storm, the Malaga Fire, the Valencia Vipers, the Murcia Cobras, and the Sevilla Scorpions. And what we've done is we've we've got a pool of about ninety to hundred girls that have been allocated the different teams, and those teams will have marquee players. You know, uh, three or four of each team will have players that play for the national side. Uh, we've set, a, set aside a minimum of 10 matches for each team, you know, over a period of four or five weekends, whether we'll play each other in T20I matches uh, with a finals week towards the end of the year. So we're looking at doing a spring, summer, fall and winter series because we're fortunate enough that we can play all year round in Spain. Um, so that's the plan for the for, for the women, and we have a new ground that is women specific in Barcelona called Ulia Campana, uh, which is going to be opening uh, in in April, and we plan to have our first matches there uh, once we get once the the the, the pitch is ready, uh, it's ready to go. We're just waiting for the licenses from the town halls to arrive. We're in conversations with the um, the people that uh, rent out the ground uh, and that's the hope that we can play our first match there and also play the international series that we're planning to have there as well so to, to you know to, to give it a highlight and exposure that this woman specific ground was was pretty much the Asian community in Barcelona uh, were fundamental in getting this ground the way the way it worked is Barcelona had some funding and they requested uh, people who live in the area to uh, put in ideas how to spend the money on exercise or any kind of um, event or uh, good idea basically and the Asian community got together rallied around and said well we want a cricket ground and this cricket ground was um, ideally for women's cricket so that was the the project they put into the barcelona uh local council barcelona government then there was a vote on it uh and the the team the the projects with the best but best number of votes received the funding until the money ran out and the the, the cricket project came second so they received the funding to build the ground um it this was about a year and a half ago uh, when I was last up in Barcelona a couple of months ago, I went down to see it uh, and it's as good as ready. 
it's just the administration side now that we're waiting for uh, and we open up to christen it with women's cricket in the next few months yeah definitely great to hear about that project and uh, the work you're doing in that um and as for your insights on the on the teams and the environment and the culture that you're creating and being competitive wanting to get better wanting to qualify yeah. uh, go through the ranks so to speak with the rankings because it's a very complicated system yeah. which a lot of people don't know when it comes to associate cricket just working your way up through the ladder really in the rankings yeah and you know, so the higher you finish you know more funding as well and yeah. It's very complicated, which, yeah. you know, trying to explain it in that complicated way, it's very hard to um, sure. understand it. But, but if you put it in that incentive now as well, because the ICC this year have started giving funding for, for the position you're ranked in both men's and women's. And, and the wonderful thing is, is what ICC have done to their credit is it, they're giving the same amount of money to the men and women. So if you're ranked... 34th uh, with the men's uh, and 34th with the women's, both the men and women will receive the same amount of funding in the ranking scorecard. Uh, so I think, uh, this is my personal opinion, I think quite a few countries will be focusing on their women's cricket because they've probably got a, a better opportunity to uh, go higher in the, in the scorecard with the women than the men. So, um, so say... You know, I won't name a country, but say one country might put more effort into their, their women to try and get to number 30 in the world when their, their men's team has been hovering around 60, you know, for the last four or five years. Um, whereas if they, they focus on the women's team, they've probably got a better opportunity of moving up because it's still quite in its infant stage, uh, the, women's, the women's game in Europe. Yeah, definitely. Amongst the mainland, not amongst Ireland and Ireland and Scotland. But, yeah. No. Yeah, definitely. Um, and, that, and that's good what the ICC are doing in, on that front. And yeah. We'll talk a bit, a bit that in our next topic, which um, is the growth and development of, of um, you know, cricket in Spain, but also associate cricket as, as well. Um, yeah. So you touched on a little bit about that, John. But before we move on to speak about that, uh, it, it was good to gain your insights on the teams and, and learn more about them. And I'm sure everyone will be wanting to watch the teams go about their business in the near future and mm. hoping great results come your way. And as an organisation, you'll be pleased with the progress that you've made. There's still a lot of work to do, mm. um, but the teams are getting better, as you said, and yeah. enthusiastic and passionate yeah. on both teams, players, uh, female and male. So that's fantastic and, and, and good to see that really come through and, and hopefully maybe one day qualify for a you know a women's or a men's t20 world cup in the near future or an icc event of some caliber so i think everyone john would would agree with me and, and say we wish you all the best in terms of how the national teams are going and, and hopefully we see spain rise up through the rankings and beware of the spaniard as they say <laughs> absolutely uh, um, um one of the things that we're working on as well as the high performance is, is the grassroots of cricket as well. Yeah. You know, it's fundamentally important that we have um, grassroots. So we've got the pathway, so we keep uh, churning out uh, players for the national side and increasing the quality and the calibre of the players. Um, this last weekend, we was in Valencia, uh, three of us, uh, the Spanish women's national coach, the chief operations officer and myself, and uh, we was introducing, uh, trying to introduce cricket to schools, and we got over 60 schools sign up for the CREO program. Uh, and what was uh, inspiring about the, the, um, the event itself was the passion and excitement of the teachers and the headmasters when we were telling about the program we were trying to run. And also, it, the, the, there were schools where we had no, uh, we don't have any cricket in, in the country at the moment. You know, uh, there was um, in Oviedo, in Asturias, in, um, in Vigo, in Galicia, in Jerez, in Andalusia, places that we was, uh, well, there is no cricket there at the moment. So this, this um, project is opening new avenues and 
it would give us the opportunity to get in at a elementary level quite early and hopefully build up those regions uh, and give exposure to cricket in areas that we struggle to do so because at the moment our, our main hubs are Barcelona, Madrid, the East Coast, the south of Spain and the islands. So if we can get into the northwest of Spain and we can get into central Spain, you know, it, it will only help because I'm sure there's cricketers in those regions, maybe not playing cricket at the moment, but, you know, there would, there would be a natural transition for them because they've, they've played fronton or pelota, uh, which are traditional bat ball sports in Spain. Uh, hockey is quite popular in Spain as well. So if we could get that trans transformation and, and get a few of these players uh, and, and say to them, look, um, there's an opportunity to play for Spain here, uh, which you probably won't get at Fronton or you probably won't get at, uh, at uh, Pelota. So please give it a go and see what you think. And one of the additive incentives when we go into the schools is... Um, if you play for the national team, then there's opportunity to get scholarships to go into universities and stuff. So, you know, that, that is a big uh, a bargaining chip that we give to the, the schools when we're presenting our project. Uh, say, well, you know, there's a good opportunity uh, and this is not a far-fetched dream. This is, this is, you know, at this point in time, anyone who's, who's decent um, at cricket has a very good opportunity to play for the national team. Yeah, definitely. Oh, that's that's fantastic to hear that, and um, hopefully you will uh, get more people in the sport um, in in Spain. So fantastic project that you're embarking on there, John, uh, with the rest of the team, of course, at Cricket Spain to to do that. Um, I thought now, John, we talk about the growth and development of cricket within Spain, and in terms of yeah. getting cricket into local communities, clubs, schools, and grassroots, yeah. etc. You touched on it briefly just just now yeah. um this this is one of the challenges john that many associate nations have is how they try and promote cricket mm. um it's easier said than done mm. uh, and you ask yourself questions and i'm sure as a ceo of cricket spain and as an organization you ask these questions um and you must sit in your chair scratching your head trying yeah. to figure out solutions on how do we do this um so in yeah. terms of how does Cricket Spain try to introduce cricket into the community? Right. How do you establish grassroots cricket, you know, clubs, local clubs and communities, uh, competitions, pathway systems, underage comps, yeah. uh, to try and build up to the national level? Um, and then having facilities like nets, ground, yeah. available for players to, to go down to their local park and play yeah. cricket or train or whatever with their club making cricket accessible to people either on TV or streams or the internet mm -hmm. um, and getting cricket into schools in their programs, as you mentioned just before, John. So, so John, what does, uh, sorry, let me try and rephrase that again. Uh, John, what challenges does Cricket Spain have in trying to grow and develop in uh, cricket in the Spanish community? And do you ever see cricket becoming uh, a mainstream sport in Spain anytime soon? Okay. Um, the, the two big challenges are promoting the, the game and then once you've done that, the sustainability and yeah. making sure that there's, there's, there's some, some opportunities that are there for them to play for a club or get, get regular cricket. Um, and that's what we're trying to do with this No Boundaries slash Creo project that we uh, touched upon, which I touched upon that we was doing in, in Valencia. Um, what we do is we we have regional we regionalise things because uh, because of the size of the, the country, and we have regional development officers, and we've actually got um, three vacancies at the moment, which we're we're putting up the job specs uh, in the in the next few days on our, our website uh, with the positions starting on April the first. Uh, one is for the regional development manager, which will oversee. All the regions, and one is for a regional development officer in in the in the south. Um, the third one is a secretary, and and that's for the admin side of things to work in conjunction with 
the directorate and the regional development manager. Uh, so we are we, so we capture everything that we're doing because that's important with regard to the the scorecard with uh, ICC. So in all these regions, we're we're providing. Um, we have a sponsor called Grizzly Sports, and we provide set cricket sets for them. When we go into the schools, um, say for instance, these uh, sixty schools that we've just uh, uh, had an um, expression of interest from. I will follow up on, on them this week uh, and write a letter requesting dates and you know times to go and visit. We will visit. We will go with quick. We will go with cricket sets. We will do the cricket sets. We will do six sessions of the um, Creo program, the Creo, Creo project. Uh, and the big thing about the Creo project that is different to other things that we've done in the past is you're teaching the teachers. So. As you're teaching the teachers, they've got the opportunity when we leave the cricket sets to do cricket when we're not around. And and there the opportunity is there for them to um, to expand their, their cricketing skills independent of Cricket Espana. At the same time, we're not going to leave them after the six sessions. We're going to do uh, a support network uh, and make sure there's a pathway for any player, any any child that wants to go further. And that will be put them in touch with a local club, um, keep them in, informed of any uh, competitions that we're having. For instance, we had a competition last last winter in Granada where the Mallorca Meerkats, a young team from Mallorca, from the islands, a team from Madrid, a team from Costa del Sol, uh, and... Uh, a group, uh, a mixed group of kids from various regions came to play um, uh, um, an under under fifteen tournament. But there was softball, and there was hardball as well. So things like that, uh, we 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 want to capture all these all these kids who want to play and give them the opportunity if they want to take it to the next step to have the opportunity to play for a club or be involved with cricket in some way definitely that's really encouraging to hear um that john um in terms of you know women's cricket female cricket um, yeah. have you noticed a, a a good number of young girls from schools wanting to take up cricket and, and play the sport uh certainly in in, in barcelona and madrid uh where you know it's kind of mushroomed uh there was a our very first tournament uh, for for the girls was in in France, um, and the nucleus of the girls came from Madrid at a project there called Phoebe. Uh, and what Phoebe was is it's a, it's, it's a project that offers opportunities to to minorities uh, uh, to to play different sports, and I think about. Nine of the girls that travelled to to um, France was um, was from the feed project. You know, the, the cluster was in Catalonia. Um, we had a bit of a quandary of: do we send them or do we not? Do we send them and they get bowled out for six, uh, or do we send them and and uh, and uh, hope that they do well? And they exceeded aspect our expectations. I mean. There was a school of thought that we were sending them six months too early, early from a certain coach, whereas our national team coach wanted to give them the opportunity to uh, to go out there and and have the chance to express themselves and, and play against competition, you know, good solid competition, um, because it wasn't just France in the competition. There was Jersey in the competition, and there was uh, Austria in the competition. Uh, I don't think we lost a game more than by 43 runs, you know, which we we didn't win a game, but we'd actually got them the opportunities that we'd promised them. We promised them that we would get them international cricket and we promised them that, um, you know, we would give them the opportunities to play uh, at, a, at a better level. Uh, 
it was it was a tough decision to be honest to decide whether to take them then or six months later but the opportunity to go to france for this tournament arose uh and we said look you know worst case scenario they get pulled out for quite a you know for not very many but they've had the experience and does the experience outweigh the result and our answer was yes so yeah so that's how we went uh and We'll probably use that philosophy again, you know, with regards to under 15s, under 19s. If we if we come to a situation where we're looking to get them uh, international cricket, yeah, definitely, definitely. It was good to hear that um, about uh, uh, women's cricket and growing and developing that in in Spain and and trying to give opportunities to these female players who just want to play cricket and. Get better and, and learn and develop their skills which is fantastic um in terms of funding and, and money um yeah. in terms of, of that um yeah. from your perspective do you think the icc are, are doing enough in terms of helping associate nations out your yeah. you know relationship with them over the yeah. years? Hey, hey listen i mean we <laughs> i mean we've gone up our funding's gone up uh two and a half times this year so we can't grumble about the funding we've yeah. got what it what that's done in itself is it's created new challenges you know in terms of administration we we need more staff and that's why we've got uh, three no, three new vacancies it also means more admin work because instead of having to give accounts twice a year we now have to give it four times a year and just little things behind the scenes like that you know which seem little but are, are, are quite major at an administration level uh uh have given us new challenges but personally you know we are very happy with what we received this year um in terms of opportunities i would love to see under 15 and under 17 tournaments again like they had 10 years ago that's that's my personal feeling i understand that you know the the icc don't feel that that's cost effective but if we're being asked to create a pathway from domestic cricket to um to senior cricket there's no bigger incentive than saying you've got the opportunity to play in an international tournament so yeah. Personally, I, I would love to see those back. Uh, I know there's arguments for and against it, but um, just just the fact that you can go into a school and say, look, you know, Spain are playing in this tournament in in Croatia against 10 different countries um, is a big fillet, not just for the teachers, but for the parents uh, and, and the kids. Yeah, definitely. Um obviously they have the under 19 world cup at the moment yeah the yeah ICC, so but, it, but but again the the under 19 and the women's cricket the criteria is quite stringent you know and i would i would also personally like to see the the bar lowered i understand why they have it so high but it would be at the moment our women's team cannot participate in an ic national women's team can't participate in an IC event because we don't have the number of women's teams playing national uh, playing 20 t20 20 overs 11 aside hard ball you need a minimum of eight teams uh and we don't quite have that at the moment uh we're getting close and we should be, be uh, we're hoping as part of the strategic plan that we've got that this year Will be the year where we do meet that uh, criteria but we know that our team would be competitive in an icc event uh because we played we've played sweden who were in the last icc event and we've beaten we beat them so you know there's there's a situation where there's a little bit of frustration because we feel we're at a national level at an international level we're high enough to compete but we're not allowed to because our national domestic is too weak you know yeah. uh, it's a balancing act and i understand the process that the icc want you to get to a 
a level and then sustain that level in order to play in those competitions. But it's frustrating for for the players who are currently playing for the international team not being able to get involved because we don't have the, the numbers right now. But we're working hard to to correct that. Yeah, definitely. Um, the reason I ask that question is that many people have their opinions about the ICC in terms of a fan's perspective yeah. and how they govern the game. Yeah. Uh, so to hear that from your yeah. point of view, dealing with them on a day-to-day -day basis is... Yeah. Hey, look, um, I think they do a good job. I mean, in, in Europe, there, there's... There's three, three people, you know, and they've got to do all of Europe. Yeah. Uh, um, and we've got more than three people involved in Spanish cricket, uh, and and we struggle too. So, you know, um, that's off to ICC Europe. You know, it's, it's easy to criticise them, but they do a lot of good things as well. Yeah, they they do, um, and, that, and that's good to hear that they're helping out and, and giving that support. Um, in terms of the Olympics, now, cricket being yeah. an Olympic sport, John, that's a yeah. big game changer for associate cricket. Yeah. Um, have you have any approaches from the government or the, you know, the Olympic Committee in Spain about funding? Um, not not yet, but uh, it's Monday today. On Wednesday, uh, Juan Carlos Rodriguez, who's the president of uh, Spanish cricket, and Jaime Gonzalez Molina, who is the chief operations officer, are actually meeting with the Spanish Sports Council, uh, um, the Consejo Superior de Deportes um, in Madrid uh, to discuss numerous things. And one of the things on the, on the agenda is the Olympics. So um, maybe being a bit slow in, in moving on that, but it's been hard to try and hard to get an appointment to, to, see, uh, to see the sports minister but uh, after uh, you know a short while of trying, we we managed to get that. And on Wednesday, uh, the two board members will be travelling to Madrid to uh, to discuss um, numerous things. And and one of the things on the agenda is the Olympics. Yeah, definitely. That, that's encouraging because I yeah. I always ask this question to the people I've interviewed in the series yeah. because it, it yeah. will make a difference in some yeah. way. Yeah. Um, in terms of funding and, and the exposure, really, even though, yeah. let's say, Spain don't qualify for the Olympic event, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's on TV, people can see yeah. it and say, oh, yeah. I didn't know we had a cricket team in Spain. I might as yeah. well take the game yeah. up. Yeah. So it's plenty of positives, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. I'm not, I'm not sure if you know, Jack, but um, I, I'm not sure exactly how many teams are we going to go to the first Olympics? Up? I think there's uh, six teams, they said. for. I think yeah, I, I did six or eight, yeah, you know, and it will be full members teams, obviously. Mm -hmm. So uh, what what I know myself and quite a few other associate nations will be interested in is if there's going to be a pathway for associate members to have the opportunity, yeah. you know, in the same way um, the World Global Qualifiers are available, you know, so... It'd be, it'd, be, it'd be nice to know, and I'm sure this is um, the discussing this in DevComs in, in Dubai or wherever they're having the next meeting. Uh, if there's going to be opportunities, not at the Olympics in Los Angeles, but Brisbane um, yeah. uh, or wherever the next Olympics is after Los Angeles, if there's, um, if there's opportunities for the likes of Spain, the likes of... Um, Czech Republic, the rights of Italy, the rights of Estonia, to have the uh, at, at least uh, you know uh, a qualifying process to go through the Olympics. Yeah, definitely, um, and that's a good point you raised, John. I didn't think about that, and none of the people who I interviewed mentioned about a pathway for associate countries. So, yeah. as you said, the ICC are probably thinking about that, and mm. it, you know, it's you know these things work themselves out mm. over time, I suppose. Mm. Um, so um, maybe it would be a bit different in 2032 in Brisbane for the Olympics. Yeah. When yeah. Cricket's there, so probably be a different pathway. Yeah, we've been um, trying a long time to get cricket in the Olympics. Uh, yeah. So um, maybe uh, small footsteps to start off with, make sure we make a good impression at the 28, and then uh, maybe push for a greater number of, of teams playing in, in 32. Definitely. Um, in terms of um, you know, growth and development of the sport in Spain, in terms of 
first of all, umpires, scorers, yeah. Yeah. coaches. Yeah. Um, just give us an update on on those fronts in terms okay. of people volunteering and giving up their time yeah. and sure. you know, yeah. doing those yeah. various roles. Mm. Uh, we we lost quite a few um, um, umpires. Uh, they didn't come back after COVID, and also we lost quite a few umpires who aren't here full time now after Brexit, because quite quite a lot of um, the re retirees out out here um, had been umpires in the past and and wanted to do a bit of umpiring at a, a domestic level. So we, so we lost some there. But on, on the flip side, we now have um, coaches and umpires that can do in-house training. Prior to, the in, in, prior to that, we had to bring in people from other countries or from the ICC or ECB to coach our coaches. But now we've got, thanks to um, opportunities created by ICC, we've had coaches go on the tutor courses. So now, we can we've got coaches and umpires that can teach uh level one courses uh without requiring people coming over from uh england or wherever which requires additional costs flight costs uh the the personal time costs yeah. and accommodation costs uh we've actually got um an umpires course in barcelona on april the 28th and 29th that weekend last weekend in april um uh, with our newly qualified umpire tutor um having said what i've just said the first umpire course that you do as a tutor you you need to be assessed in the, doing it and so sue redfern or you may, may know the, the international but she's coming over to assess adnan um on his very first umpire's course to to make sure he's um you know covering everything that's required on that course we we have five ladies and i think it's eight or nine men yeah we have a coaches course again um, um we have um the actual the women's national coach neil brook is a coach tutor and we have several several others as well um and, and neil will be doing a course as well after we've had the umpires course um so probably in May. And again, the focus there will be on female coaches, giving them the, the first, uh, they, they, they will get they, they will get precedence if, if they're interested and they meet the, the basic criteria to, uh, to go on the course, then they will get preference first because we want to promote. And we want to have some women umpires and we want to have some more women coaches as well. Yeah. Definitely. And on the scoring front, obviously scoring is a very difficult game. Yeah, sco scoring front, um, the, the ICC offer um, or will be offered an online course there. Yeah. And we do our own Cricket Espana um, uh, course, uh, which isn't ICC accredited, but uh, you know, but it, it, it's sufficient for most scorers. Um, we also have, um, we're also linked with Crick Clubs. And Crick Clubs um, uh, have agreed to do um, a digital online platform uh, uh, refresher uh, for for new people uh, because picking up the digital is uh, is important. Uh, a lot of clubs prefer it. A lot of clubs are old school and don't want to move past the books, uh, the school book. Uh, you know, and there's there's arguments for both, uh, but as we get more and more technology savvy, ICC are, are requesting more and more digital, um, although the school book always takes preference in ICC tournaments. Uh, it, they, they, they do want, as evidence, uh, scorecards, um, and obviously they prefer digital scorecards online than to my scrawny handwriting if I'm doing the scoring that they can't read. <laughs> Yes, well, that's understandable. If it's a global tournament, you want to be yeah. precise because yeah. you can't get it wrong there. So that's understandable. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's good to hear about the coaches and the umpires and the scorers and the volunteers. Um, have you noticed a lot of 
people, a lot of clubs popping up around Spain, people creating their own clubs or? Yeah, um, probably, probably the best example of that is Granada Cricket Club. They've not only uh, created their own club, uh, the president has created his own ground. Uh, wow. Yeah, yeah. He's, um, he's an Australian, actually. He might really? be from South, South Australia. I'm not 100% sure. But yeah, uh, he's, he, he actually uh, bought a piece of land. Uh, um, and it's a beautiful setting, Jack. It's, uh, uh, it's about 10 minutes from Granada Airport. Uh, and you can actually see the Sierra Nevada um, um, mountains in the background. So you can you can snow and play cricket in the same day. Um, uh, quite a is had quite a few touring sites come over now. Uh, uh, he had a GoFundMe uh, page that uh, raised ten thousand euros towards his uh, you know getting the irrigation and. And stuff. Uh, Cricket Espana provided uh, uh, a grant to help him with uh, with the um, incentives that the grant uh, was on. The the, the uh, we we granted a loan with the incentive that it would become a grant uh, if they created a women's team and an under nineteen team by a certain time. So the incentive was there for them to you know. They got the money, but the incentive was there to work on stuff that was important on the yeah. uh, Cricket Espana um, remit. Uh, and as we said, we had a junior tournament there. Uh, um, there's now two clubs as opposed to one club in Granada because of the interest. Um, he's also got additional funding recently because uh, he's allowed some baseball to be played there. So, you know, very, very, uh, it's a, it's a marquee um, example of what can be done uh, from a cricket Espana perspective because grounds are a big issue. You know, grounds are a big issue because trying to get a ground in in, in Madrid or, or Barcelona that's exclusive cricket, um, ground um, property and, and space is paramount in those areas. So trying to get somewhere close to Madrid um, is nigh on impossible. So. Uh, yeah yeah that, that's fantastic well i have to look at a photo or something john or when i go I'll to spain some, i'll send you some uh some links yeah yeah well that's fantastic uh the the power of cricket isn't it? the passion of cricket you know, people yeah. go to these links to you know hmm. do what they can for the game which is fantastic um in terms of um from your perspective as the ceo um Give us a bit of an insight on what's it like being a CEO of, a, of, a, of an associate country because yeah. many people don't realise the hard work and the hour, long hours that go into mm. doing a job like you do, John. Yeah. Uh, in terms of um, going about things in terms of growing and developing the sport and, yeah. you know, funding and going to meetings yeah. with the ICC and dealing with all that. So just give people a snapshot of, you know, how you came into this job and the yeah. challenges – connected to it um, well i came into the job by by default really because back in 2003 when i first came to spain i i went to i saw an advert in the uh, local paper an english paper saying that there was a cricket club 20 kilometers away and they were looking for players so i started there um one of the people there was the secretary of uh, Cricket Espana at the time, Claire Sunderland, and she asked me if I'd be interested in, in, in getting more involved from an admin standpoint. And then just as time's gone by uh, and we've developed, I've kind of morphed into the cricket chief executive officer's role. Um, it's a labour of love and it's very time consuming. Um, it can be frustrating at times it has its challenges obviously but uh, it can also be incredibly rewarding i mean this last weekend in valencia for instance it was it, it recharged the batteries in many ways and it was very inspiring to to see all these professionals come to our stall and show genuine excitement about what we was off offering you know yeah. and it, it's the successes like that that uh, keep you going you know um 
the uh, the national teams, you know, working with the other CEOs uh, from other other countries. Uh, as you you know, the network is is strong and and there's a good support group there. Um, you meet fantastic people. Uh, the family of cricket is second to none. Um, one day I can be having a, a a chat with someone from Kuwait, and the next day uh, talking to someone from uh, Estonia. You know, uh, mm. it's just you don't know what what the day is going to unravel, uh, which keeps it exciting, keeps it fresh, keeps you on your toes. Um, um, problems arise from uh, where you've got to put out fires once in a while, you know, um, but the majority of the time it's uh, an incredibly enjoyable thing to do uh, um, and, and I'm privileged to be in that position. Oh, that's good to hear, John. It's good to hear that um, you're doing your bit for, for cricket and giving back and wanting Cricket Spain to do well and uh, see the game grow and develop in, in Spain uh, as well. And uh, from what you've told us about the growth and development, it's encouraging. Um, there's good progress being made, but there's still a long way to go to climb that mountain and get to the summit, as they say. Um, so it's really good encouraging signs that the game is growing and developing in, in Spain and people are generally interested in cricket, which is fantastic. Yeah. So hopefully you can become one of the mainstream sports and Spain probably won't overtake football because <laughs> no. that's still the number one sport no. in Spain. But let's hope it gets up to the list and, um, you know, people take notice of cricket and get behind yeah. the teams and yeah. support the game of cricket. And good to hear those stories about people making grounds and yeah. doing all that. It's wonderful, wonderful to hear that. So, so thank you, John, for sharing uh, your insights on the growth and development of cricket in Spain. I think a lot of people would have being positive by what you have said in terms of that things are really moving along, which is, which is fantastic. Um, well, John, we've, we've reached the end of our, of our chat. Uh, we've got one more topic to talk about. So I've okay. Got, I've, I've yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, we've got one more. Uh, we're nearly done. Um, um, and for our last topic, John, I, I thought we'd talk about what the future holds for cricket in Spain. I know it's very hard to predict the future, as we know. But, John, how do you see Spain cricket and associate cricket going into the future? So if you had right. to look into the crystal ball and predict, what do you yeah. think? Yeah, well, one of the things that uh, the ICC were keen for us to uh, do was a strategic plan. Uh, so the strategic plan is a five-year plan of what we would like to achieve between 2023 and 2027 in uh, in spain um and the, there's four sections to that plan uh participation people uh teams and uh the platform uh, this is the spanish version we also have it in english just to give you a few examples of what the participation was that we one of the the points that we want to try and achieve is to get ten thousand new children playing every year cricket so that's that's one of the, the things um, to create a coaches and umpires association that's sustainable and has a minimum of 100 members. That's another thing that we're looking to achieve. Uh, to increase better ties with the sports government, which is what we're doing with um, the meeting on Wednesday. And we hope to make that a kind of a regular thing every, every three months or something like that, where we meet up with, um, with our... Uh, a point of contact uh, who is a is a is, she's played in the Olympics herself and she was a um, she she was a judo she she did judo so so it's someone who's who knows about the Olympics is keen about the Olympics and I'm sure she'll be supportive of what we're trying to do to get in the Olympics uh, and then the under 19s and the women's sides that I've touched on that we meet and sustain the ICC criteria so that we can play in those competitions. That's another one of our goals, yeah. Um, there's about 30 goals in total. Um, some uh, have been given more priority than others. Um, and we are, uh, we've reached a couple already, uh, you know, in the first year. Um, but if we could reach most, if not all of those goals, 
then the future is going to be very, very bright. Uh, and we'll continue to search forward and um, hopefully up the rankings in both and men's and women's cricket. Definitely. Um, uh, that's a, a perfect prediction into the future, John. Hopefully <laughs> those goals can be achieved. Um, is there a PDF form or something we can leave? Yeah, it's on the website. I, I will send you a copy. Um, it's, I think it's on a Flickr. So yeah, you know, the flicker where you can see the page space, but it's it's on our, our website. If I could give the website a plug, cricketspain.org. It's actually a new website. Um, it's been it's it's still in the final stages of being uh, tweaked, uh, but we we we've kind of upgraded it from the website last year because social media is a big factor that, that we want to try and uh, get greater mileage out of. Um, so yeah, uh, and it's under the Cricket Espana ta tab at the at the um, uh, at the at the top of the the, the toolbar, um, and it's uh, in with amongst uh, the anti-corruption policies, the anti-racism racism policies, the job vacancies, uh, the constitution, all that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, it's it's on the Cricket Espana website, uh, and I will send you a link to it as well, so you can have a look and uh, come back with any questions you may have on that. Definitely. I, th I think our listeners will be keen to, to have read sure. as well. Um, so we'll leave a link to that in the description of, of this episode for people to check out the, the plan, the strategic plan for the next few years in, in Cricket Spain. But it was good to hear your you know, predictions into the future, John, and uh, the goals and the plan that you put in place as an organisation to grow and develop cricket in Spain and achieve good things is fantastic. So you must be really proud of the of the work that you've put in and the team as well mm. to, to draft up this plan and uh, have this strategy in place, which is fantastic. We, we have a great team. Uh, uh, you know, the, the steps that we've made since I first joined in 2003, 2004, uh, we have every right to be proud of because we, we, we've gone from strength to strength. Uh, by no means, we've not finished yet. Uh, and we've still got quite a few goals that we want to achieve, but uh, we're certainly, um, you know, an up-and-coming affiliate nation like so many of them are, uh, uh, and we're push pushing hard to to get to the next level. Definitely. Um, so, so thank you for sharing that, John, about the future and what it holds for uh, Spain going forward in the in the cricketing world. Um, it was good to hear your thoughts on that. Um, Thank you, John, uh, for joining me for this Associate Cricket Series episode to discuss all things Spain cricket with us today. I've really enjoyed it. I've learned so much. I hope you had a, a good time chatting to me today about, about it as well. And everyone listening and watching enjoyed it, hopefully, as well. Um, John, if people want to get in touch with you and get in touch with Cricket Spain, where can they do that? You mentioned the website, but other links as well that people can get in contact with. Yeah. If, if they want to get in touch, then it's john at cricketspain.org. And the website is www.cricketspain.es. Yeah. Um, so uh, we'll leave links to those in the description of this episode for, for people to uh, check out um, if they want to get in touch with John or um, want to learn more about cricket in Spain. Uh, we'll, we'll definitely leave links to those in the description of, of this episode. Uh, before we go, remember to like, share, comment, subscribe, and click the bell to make sure you get the latest episodes of the podcast. Be sure to like and share our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter and on Instagram. Also, the podcast is available on Anchor, Spotify, and on Apple Podcasts. Once again, thank you, John, for joining me today to discuss all things Spain cricket. I hope all of you watching or listening to this Associate Cricket Series episode learned a lot about cricket in Spain from John. Until next time, keep safe and. Bye for now.